The Hopf bifurcation, as we have looked at it, should remind you a little bit of a pitchfork bifurcation. And that means that there's a certain detail that you're going to have to pay attention to. If we take the normal form for the Hopf bifurcation, write it out in polar coordinates, then what do we get? We get dr dt equals mu times r plus cr cubed, and d theta dt is a constant, omega. Now, in that radial component, we have exactly a pitchfork bifurcation, but it's a little bit different in that r has to be non-negative. Now, recall that in a pitchfork, what really matters is the coefficient c in front of the cubic term. This splits into two types of bifurcations, the supercritical versus the subcritical. Recall that the supercritical bifurcation happens when c is negative. The subcritical bifurcation happens when c is positive. In the supercritical case, what we have is what we just saw previously in that visualized example, where a stable equilibrium gives birth to a stable limit cycle that periodic orbit that you are attracted to. And just as with a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation, a supercritical Hopf is a safe bifurcation. In contrast, a subcritical Hopf bifurcation leads to an unstable limit cycle. And it is decidedly an unsafe situation to find yourself in. This is worth some careful contemplation. If you examine the supercritical versus the subcritical Hopf bifurcation, focusing on what is happening in the radial direction, then in the supercritical case, you have a stable equilibrium on one side of the bifurcation. Very good. On the other side of the bifurcation, you have a stable limit cycle and that equilibrium at the center has become unstable. That is a spiral source now. Now this is fine because if you start off at that stable equilibrium and let's say that your parameters change and all of a sudden now there's some vibration, some oscillation in the system, but that's okay because you're on that stable limit cycle and you're vibrating, you're resonating, you're doing whatever you do. If you don't like that, then you can turn the dial back down and that stable limit cycle will collapse to the origin and you'll be back at a stable equilibrium. Those vibrations have damped out, everything's good. On the other hand, in the subcritical case, you might be at that stable equilibrium, just like before, and you don't know whether you're supercritical, subcritical, all you know is that the vibrations have damped out and everything's fine, but you change the dial and you go past that subcritical Hopf bifurcation, all of a sudden now, just as in a supercritical case, your oscillations are growing over time. But instead of converging to a stable limit cycle, your oscillations just keep growing and growing and growing. So you panic, you turn the dial back down. But if you don't turn it down enough, you might be outside of that unstable limit cycle that you never even knew was there. And so you're still spiraling out of control. And so you try to turn that dial way down again, but it's a lost cause at this point. Subcritical, very dangerous. It's definitely worth visualizing what is happening in the supercritical and subcritical case, not just in the XY plane, but in the full three-dimensional XY mu space. In the case of a supercritical Hopf bifurcation, then you can see that stable equilibrium forming a line in that space, and then the stable limit cycle giving you a paraboloid in that full three-dimensional space. Now you slice it at any value of mu, and it gives you a circle, that stable limit cycle. But seeing the full picture in 3D, very helpful. Likewise, in the subcritical Hopf bifurcation, if you look at that in the full three-dimensional space, now your limit cycles are unstable and they form an unstable paraboloid in that full three-dimensional space that encases the line of stable equilibria. Being able to see what is happening in that full three-dimensional space is really helpful for distinguishing between the supercritical 
and the subcritical Hopf bifurcations. And it's also great for solidifying in your mind the relationship between the pitchfork bifurcations that we saw back in volume one and the Hopf bifurcations that we are seeing now. That is worth thinking about.